Hello, welcome back to another exciting episode of Hogwarts Dropout Radio. Uh, we're glad that you've joined us for the finale of Philosopher's Stone. Woo! Yeah, I am your host, uh, Matt Muggle-Saint. I am voted most likely to be stood up in the Forbidden Forest. And joining <laughs> me, as ever, is my co-host, Reba. Hi, I'm Reba Mac and Cheese. I am, uh... <laughs> Uh, I guess I guess I'm more of a an indoor kind of person, not not going to the gay sex forest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that that said, uh, yeah, I so but I, let's just sort of I, we we always forget to do this uh, properly each time. Mm. But I guess we could do it for the finale, just just to get our all ducks in order. Hogwarts dropout radio. I am a longtime Harry Potter scholar, and as you can tell by a- by my accent, I am not British. And Matt, uh, sitting across from me, across the the channel, uh, or across the uh, across the interwebs, across the pond, across the pond. That's what that, that's what you just say. The channel's the other thing. Um, Matt sitting across from me, across the pond, is a British man who has never read the series before. Yes. Uh, he has wit- he has seen one of the movies many moons ago, and he has been a hard Harry Potter denier for years <laughs> until now. <laughs> just just going back a little bit, I like you implying across the channel as if you're French. Right. I know. I, I, re- I just realized that was incorrect, and I I would I'm I'm tempted to cut that part where I'm wrong. Um, but <laughs> I I don't know, maybe maybe that makes me look more American. <laughs> so. We are on the last two chapters of Philosopher's Stone. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Feel free to just keep listening. We, we, we'd love that. Um, but if you want to have a bit more context, you can follow along from the start. Uh, but Reba's going to give you a quick recap of what's happened so far. Right. So, uh, the the entire the entirety of the Harry Potter book has happened so far, almost. Um, the main context, I suppose, you need going into... This cha- the first chapter here through the trapdoor is that we are at a school. I don't know if any of y'all remember that, but this is a school where we have lessons and grades and exams. And so uh, that is the first thing that we spend time on uh, in this first chapter is that uh, uh, Harry, Harry's taking his exams. And there's a lot of pressure going on because Ooh. in addition to the pressures of being at a magical school, uh where you have to get good grades and pass all your courses and everything. There's also uh, this looming threat of the Dark Lord Voldemort coming back to life via the Philosopher's Stone. And the his ability to do that is currently... Uh, like, it, it, it's, it, it comes down to, it seems, it's, it comes down to if he can get through all of the enchantments that have been put up by the various teachers at the school, the barriers yes. between someone interested in the stone and the stone. The, and the veritable Cheeto in the door lock of security. Yes. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, Harry, Ron, and Hermione have put together at this point that it seems it seems like the stone is still they they, they feel like like uh, whoever Lord Vobler is on the, the verge of getting the stone but he has he doesn't quite have all the pieces yet or so they think uh because you need you know like Erica, all the con- teachers contribute something and so you kind of need it, it's like a video game you need mm. like the thing the solution to keys. each one right you need the skeleton key for for each of uh each of their things yeah. and they don't know what all the things are but they do know that they think that he's been able to get past most of them mm. uh but they they think that Hag the the, the big one the, the first one Hagrid's dog, uh, which is a giant three headed Cerebus named Fluffy, who is very iconic, quite quite a legend, and Fluffy they think uh, he's the one that he's he is the first thing that you encounter uh, when trying to get at the stone, and it and so far they 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 think that. Fluffy is still securely guarding it. They ha- He hasn't figured out how to do it yet. They've overheard him over the course of the year trying to figure out how to get past the dog, and they don't think he's been able to do it yet. Yeah. Uh, but still, they they realize that this is... It's getting down to the wire now, and mm. so there's this looming threat 
that's sort of hanging over their heads, especially Harry's head, because if Voldemort comes back, he's going to try to kill Harry. So Harry's feeling this, uh, like, lo- this, like, angst and pressure while he's also trying to deal with his, you know, first year exams. Yeah, because fuck all that drama. Uh, we have got last year exams, end of year exams to do. Yes. <laughs> um, I like them just quickly running through some of the tests that are coming up. McGonagall mm-hmm. apparently is having them turn a mouse into a snuff box. And not knowing what that is, I have to assume it's just like a cube of rat gore. I guess. <laughs> uh, a, uh, wait, a, a snuff box is like... Uh, I'm just gonna Google snuff box. I never looked this up. Oh, it's like it's like a thing that contains tobacco. Oh, uh, so she's teaching them. To yeah, smoke. it was very fashionable in like the 18th century. So this is like a okay. It's like <laughs> so it's a two part exam. The first half is making the snuff box, and the second is being able to smoke like chain smoke like, a full <laughs> pack of cigarettes. Uh, I wonder if you get bonus points for having snuff in in your snuff box when you uh, when she opens it <laughs> it's like how good is your hash <laughs> is the exam um we don't really get a whole lot more of like the end of year exam stuff we get like a little bit of mention of harry getting these migraines and he's finally relatable to me um yes. but yeah we mostly like we, we really cover quite a lot of time quite quickly here like we jump forward quite a bit even from the last chapter it feels like um yeah we get like a little detail that i like that hermione is taking all of her exam papers back with her after each one which is something i would do after every exam at uni and then never look at (laughs) (laughs) well she's also doing that i there, there there was a very i i i like how at this point we very much settled into the trio and sort of the dynamics within the trio and i feel like i don't know this is as a season, as a finale for the book goes, the thing that it really showcases in these chapters is their friendship and like the strength of the trio. And you get a lot of like very fun banter between them, very fun friendship moments between them. And it's something that I'm coming to uh, very much appreciate about the way that the characters are written here. Where even as like 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 they'll be very snarky and very sassy with each other, but it's always there's this kind of affectionate way to it, yeah. where it comes from a place of like 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 Hermione, uh, like the, the the narrative sort of pokes a bit of fun, ribs Hermione a bit for how after they're done with their exams, she then wants to talk about the exams and review the thing they just did, and Ron is like, "This makes me feel ill. Please don't do it." Yeah, and- no, this is exactly what. Um- like all the dudes who I was good friends with, but were massive fucking nerds, what they do after exams, and it's just like, yes, no, and, shut up, right? And that says both stuff about Ron's character, Hermione's character. It's fun to see them do that together, but also when Ron says, "Oh, this makes me feel ill," he's not like bullying Hermione, like, "Oh, you're such a nerd." He's like, "I understand this is a you thing," and like, it, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's I don't know, it's it's a very affectionate kind of ribbing. I and get this is your it, thing, but shut the fuck up. <laughs> Yes, exactly. I love you, but please stop. It's it's making me sick. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, and like, also, Ron is having to contend with Harry going full like conspiracy theorist mode. He is yes, Harry is out. like, <laughs> oh my god. We we get kind of a Harry moment a little bit further into this, uh, where he kind of not exactly cracks, but like he he kind of has this little outburst. Um, he- He's doing, like, the Pepe Silvia. He's got, like, the the bulletin board full of, like, random documents all connected together with string. <laughs> yes, exactly. And one of those stuff, one of those things is, like, the centaurs and one of those things. Yes. It's... And, yeah, anyhow. So, uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot of... There's some tight plot stuff that comes out. Come, mm. Comes up. I'm sort of like... I'm waiting for you to kind of, like, do the summary of that before I get into talking about it because it's a little bit... It, it's a little bit to explain. Yeah, so the upshot of, like, these conversations is that Harry has realised that someone giving Hagrid this dragon egg wasn't quite as pointless as it seemed at the time. Yes! Ha-ha! <laughs> it wasn't filler! It had a purpose! I told you! Um, I have... He finds it quite suspicious, yeah. So they go to talk to Hagrid, who... I, I like the way they describe him, like, shelling peas with his trousers and sleeves rolled up, like he's fucking Huck Finn. Like... Yeah! 
I, I like how you can just walk in on Hagrid doing anything, and sometimes it's like, oh, he's he has a dragon egg he's taking care of, and sometimes it's, oh, he's shelling peas, or he's knitting, and all of these things are within the scope of Hagrid's life. It's like he, sometimes, he, he, sometimes he's playing the banjo and singing about being a cage and alligator hunter. Yeah, it's just kind of like the, the breadth of Hagrid's existence is admirable, uh, uh, but yeah, Hagrid sort of greets them, asks him if he would like to drink, which I have to assume he means an after-exam pint, uh, which is... Yeah, and Ron is like, yes, I am 11, sign me up. <laughs> but they start talking to him, and, like, Harry basically fucking interrogates a 40-year-old man <laughs> about yes. what happened with him meeting this guy who sold him the dragon egg. And we find out that Hagrid, while drunk at the pub, was approached by a hooded man who sweet-talked him into revealing secrets about his life and gave him illicit substances. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, they realize Hagrid let slip about, like, what is the way of getting past Fluffy, and that also he fucking told this random stranger that as well. Yes, and Hagrid only is just now realizing this, that this uh, is the thing that he did. I So... I like Hagrid, but yeah, he probably shouldn't have been trusted with this. No! <laughs> he really okay. fucked this one up. Yeah, oh my god, Hagrid. Oh my god. And it's like, the, the whole thing, like, the thing that happens, this didn't, like, Harry's like, oh wow, it's such a weird coincidence that there's someone who happens to have a dragon egg in town who happens, like, to, to find Hagrid. And I'm like, that's not a coincidence. Like, oh. every single illegal animal dealer, like, this side of mm. the continent knows about Hagrid. I, and knows I, that if they have something to trade, you, you go to that guy. I, I took it as, like, um, like, like, he's saying it like, yeah, it's a real fucking coincidence, isn't it? But I don't <laughs> believe in coincidence. <laughs> and, like, he's right, but he's also, like, has the craziest eyes while he's saying this. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so they decide to go and talk to McGonagall the first time, I think, they decided to talk to an authority figure. No, Hagrid does not count. Um, Hagrid extremely does not count, as he has just demonstrated. It, it, she basically, like, brushes them off. She seems, it's kind of funny how she's, like, surprised to hear they know about the Philosopher's Stone, but then just is kind of like, eh, whatever, go, go outside, fuck off. Yeah, well, she, yeah, she just kind of tries to get them away from the situation, yeah. it seems. But, which I suppose is reasonable, but, like, considering how things play out, I think she didn't take the warning seriously enough. Perhaps, yeah. Uh, and then, as she leaves, Snape shows up, and this scene is still playing under the assumption that uh, Snape's the one who is trying to steal the stone. And it's hilarious, give, in the context that he is not. Yes, it is a, yes. It is... <laughs> He, Why he, is he acting like this? He's just fucking with them for no reason. He has been a teacher for I don't know how many years, and he still just shows up and just fucking intimidates children like a loan shark. I don't know what's wrong with him. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, he does He does hate Harry, like, specifically. Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, I think by the time... We're going to get to the end of this book. And, like, Harry comes away from the conversation with Dumbledore at the end with the suspicion that Dumbledore kind of knew the whole, most of the time that, you know, the, that the Scooby gang were trying to figure out the Philosopher's Stone. Yeah. And I, th okay, my, my theory actually right now is that Dumbledore, uh, Snape, it, Snape, Snape works pretty closely with Dumbledore as his double agent dude. And I wouldn't be surprised if Snape was also rather aware of the the Scooby gang snooping around. Yeah, and he them I don't think at least once. I think I think that with Snape, he's been making the assumption that these stupid eleven year olds think that they're going to steal they're going to be able to steal the stone. And yes. so like in this moment where he's like, you you should go outside you go outside and play and sort of doing this intimidation thing while also kind of mocking them. I think that that's kind of what this is, is that he thinks yeah. that they are that they think that they can try to steal the stone. He's like, no, that's stupid. Also, you sh that don't be doing that, you dumb kids. I, uh, that's, that's a good reading of. Unfortunately, the extended cut of the films reveals that he did say this to three other students. Uh, right <laughs> <before them. laughs> 
That is true. That's fair. Uh, they, yeah, <laughs> he just so, is like this. <laughs> they, they they have like a plan to like stake out the corridor where the um, philosopher's stone is, while Hermione stays back and like tries to keep an watch out for Snake, Snape. But that falls through, and they end up back in the common room after McGonagall chases him off. And Harry says, like, enough's enough, I am going to try and get the stone first. Yeah, so he does try to do the thing, that, mm. which is, I'm going to try to steal the stone before Voldemort steals the stone. And I just want to make a note here, because he says, like, in, in, this, in his little speech, where he, he's kind of cracking, because he yeah. thinks that he's going to die if Voldemort gets the stone, and his, like his life's going to be over, at Hogwarts and in general, and, like, Ron Hermione, like, trying to steal the stone. That's, this sounds crazy and stupid, Harry. It's like, I don't, I don't care. I'm feeling crazy and stupid. <laughs> and, and there's a part where he says, I'll never join the dark side. Oh, and, yeah, that cracked me up. Oh, my, okay, so here's the thing. Like, the the dark side. And this, this I feel like we have to explain a bit if you haven't read Harry Potter in a while. Or maybe if you only saw the movies and have kind of vague memories of it. The, the dark side as a thing is is not really established in this first book as like a thing it's it's meant I I go I, I, I word searched it in the book to check this and it does it is mentioned exactly once and it is when Ron is meant talking about Malfoy's family and Ron says oh yeah like they didn't need uh much like they like the how Malfoy's family um joined Voldemort's side and they, they claim to have been imperious afterwards, or they, they, they claim to have been mind-controlled afterwards. But it's like, well, they didn't really need much encouragement to go to the dark side, did they? Mm. Um, and that, that's the only time when the phrase, the dark side, has been ever mentioned. Or the idea that it's something you could join in, like, the Star Warsian sense. Like, there's a light and dark side to magic. That's not a thing. And so... I think it's funny to imagine Harry is using a term that is not really, like, in part of wizard canon, and he has just yes. seen Star Wars. I know! Yeah, that, that is exactly what I'm thinking. He has seen <laughs> Star Wars at some point, uh, and that is entirely, that, that is how he's viewing this. And the problem is, you know, the reference goes over Ron's head, he's not into muggle shit, and Hermione isn't allowed to watch films with guns in them, so... Right, I don't think, yeah, Hermione... Uh, she's not that kind of a nerd. I I, I think she would. I, I I know she she doesn't seem to be like into like uh, popular nerd fiction culture. in that way. Yeah. Yeah, into into pop culture in that way. And Ron, of course, would have no idea. And so they're just kind of like, okay. <laughs> uh, he, he even mentions like like they kind of flatten uh, Hogwarts if Voldemort gets his way. And I just imagined him with like a fleet of bulldozers. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Bring it out, boys. <laughs> Oh, and it's, it, it's so funny to hear that, like that, to hear this this early on, because eventually we do get some of what Voldemort's plans are in the later books, and it's not really what Harry envisions here. Mm. Um, it's, it, it's a lot different. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to get into it because it sort of gets into Voldemort's, the deeper aspects of Voldemort's character that aren't, yeah. aren't really uh, shown to us yet. Yeah, whereas uh, Harry's but that like... Is, here it's like Disney villain who wants to tear down the rec center. Yes, yes! And that is not really what Voldemort's deal is at all. In fact, that's kind of the opposite of what his deal is, in a way. Um, they, they have to win the Hogwarts talent show to get enough money to buy a gun to shoot Voldemort with. Ah! I mean, that's kind of what they end up doing with going through the <laughs> trap door here. Yeah, uh, but okay, 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 so Harry, the Harry Star Wars fan... Potter. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he drops it's... the dead parent card, and basically that's kind of a checkmate here. He's going, yes. Hermione and Ron are going with him. Uh, yes. Hermione isn't worried about being expelled because she got 115% on Professor Quirrell's desk. I love her. That is, I think, my favorite. That's my favorite Hermione moment of this entire <laughs> yeah. book. It's yeah. when she's just like, no, I'm too fucking good for them to expel me, uh, actually. I think it's very cool that Hermione has made her first joke. Yes! Yeah! I <laughs> The inaugural Hermione joke. Congratulate, we're so proud of you. Well, also just because it's like, 
I don't like she like she worries so much about all of this and she ties so much of her self-esteem into this. But now she's like she's kind of feeling her chill. She's like, no, yeah, I I I'm hot shit actually. And yes, I'm gonna go do like the most dangerous thing yet we've ever done. Happily, because <laughs> Uh yeah, so as they go to leave, uh, fortunately, Neville has chosen this moment to nut up. Um, oh my god, yes! Da, 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 da. <laughs> I, I like to imagine him wearing a onesie, like a big Pikachu fuzzy hoodie onesie thing. That's basically, that's almost what they have him in, in the movies, where <laughs> like, he's in like his pajamas. pajamas. Uh, he says that if they're sneaking out, he can't let them do that. They've lost so many house points, and it's uh, dangerous. And I like that he, like, throws in, like, you taught me to stand up for myself. And Ron's like, yeah, but not, like, towards us. <laughs> I love Ron. Okay. Conti- okay, yeah. And so this is this is, this is is the Neville moment that, that I told you. That I think before you had chosen Neville as, like, your mm. favorite person of the, of, of the week. And this is... This, this is what it builds up to, is Neville stands up to them for the right reasons, but it's the wrong moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, like, it's like genuinely a little bit sad that they've betrayed Neville's trust so much that the bro code has fallen apart at this crucial moment. <laughs> and, then, and then Hermione does, like, the most terrifying thing to him that anyone yeah. has yet done. It is fucked that an 11-year-old knows how to, like, nerve gas a person. <laughs> yeah! I I mean this is Hermione. I think that it's likely that most people her age don't know how to do that. That said, within a f- couple of years they would, and mm. so that is yeah that, that that's like especially like at a school with teenagers. That's a terrible thing to Rebo, know. Rebo, does it not make it more frightening that there is a disparity in when you can learn it? Like. That Hermione knows how to do it, and most people don't her age. I think that might make it worse. Yeah, I mean, that that makes her as an individual more terrifying. I guess, like, the existence of this spell being this easy. They're 11 right now, so, like, the worst thing that could happen is that, like, I don't know, someone could beat you up very easily with it. Uh, Down the road, though, that's quite bad. That Mm. is quite, quite bad. But, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're 11, don't think about it. Yeah, so Neville, unfortunately, he didn't even have his wand. He was, like, stanced up fists out trying to stop him. Oh my (laughs) god. (laughs) He gets taken out, they feel real bad about it, and they set off towards the uh, Forbidden Corridor. Yes. Uh, Along the way, we get kind of, like, a return of, like, our favorite mini-bosses. Peeves shows up and is fooled by an 11-year-old trying to sound like the Bloody Baron. Like, he... Uh, Yeah... How did you do that, Harry, with your 11-year-old voice? How did you do that? Peeves can tell someone's invisible, but Harry tricks him into thinking it's the Bloody Baron, who is invisible. And ghosts, I don't think, can be invisible. Yeah, so... I don't know, I I suppose Peeves could just be stupid. I think Peeves is just extremely stupid. (laughs) And Um, and and then we also, we briefly, like, mini-bosses, we also get Mrs. Norris, uh, and Ron wants to kick her, and because, because... Okay, I, I, I love Ron a little bit less in that moment. Ah, you know, more power to him. Cat doesn't deserve it. Yeah. Uh, so they get to the Forbidden Corridor, and they open the door, finding Fluffy, who... I quite like this imagery of, like, a harp being there that whoever has snuck in has used to put Fluffy to sleep once already. <laughs> That's quite... Oh, speaking of that, that is... Okay, mental image-wise thing to keep in mind is that as they're moving through this, Quirrell and Voldemort on the back of Quirrell's head have uh, had to do uh, all uh, of the... Uh, spoilers, Reba! We don't give it. A... <laughs> <laughs> but this is not a spoiler. This is... No. Uh, but it's like, spoiler is so... 20-year-old book for children. 20-year-old book for children that I think it's assumed that most people listening have read. Or yeah. if they... If, if they if they haven't, then they do not care about spoilers while listening to this. <laughs> anyway, but so one of the funniest, or, or what something that was amusing to think about as they move through the uh, the various challenges, which are all like, so they they face in succession the challenges from all of the teachers uh, have put in place to guard the philosopher's stone, 
and they're following uh, Quirrell, which they think is Snape, but it's Quirrell, who has gone through these challenges before them. And a lot of them are very, like, I, I like I imagine Quirrell with Voldemort on the back of his head, this two-man show. Like, <sighs> do... Like, they, I, I, they probably... Did he enchant the harp to play by itself, or did Quirrell have to play the harp with, like, Voldemort correcting his form on the back of his head? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Laurel and Hardy. Did, 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 did they sing a little harp duet before they then jumped into the trapdoor? Aww. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Were you imagining, like, a hand harp, or a, I was imagining a full-sized one. Oh, yeah, in my opinion, that, that is very... I... I, I, I would guess that 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 it, he used some kind of enchantment, but it's not mm. playing anymore. So whatever the enchantment was, it must have worn off either very quickly if he wasn't actually playing it. Well, look, Reaper, it plays Wonderwall once, and that's all you need. <laughs> Everyone's all over you at that point. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so then Harry plays uh, so something on Hagrid's flute, which he, he basically just like does a few notes, and the dog passes out. Is this thing on fucking Xanax? I guess so. Well, I think I know, it could be that the uh, the harp, maybe the harp kind of primed him. It loosened that jelly maybe. jar. Uh, anyhow, but yeah, so then they, uh, Harry goes, f- no, yes, Harry goes first through the trap door, and mm-hmm. then Ron and Hermione follow, and what they land on is a plant yes. uh, called the Devil's first, I think it's quite cute. At first they think it's just there to cushion your landing. <laughs> That is quite cute. But no, it, it's trying to kill you. Um, and then this is... Th- this next part is a Hermione moment. Where uh-huh. uh, Hermione uses fl- u- uses the blue flames, which we've seen her conjure before. Our HM, our HM slave uses one one of the, the things that she knows. And she gets us through this challenge. And this is something that is noteworthy because it's different from the movies. Um, mm-hmm. Where in the movies... Harry and Ron kind of are the ones who lose their heads, and Hermione is the one who's like, oh, I know Devil's Snan, and she, like, remembers, like, a little poem for it, and then she does the thing and gets them out. And then, uh, Harry's like, he's like, it's like, good thing Hermione remembered her lessons, Ron. Uh, whereas in the book, Hermione is the one who kind of goes, like, deer in headlights the way that she can do. Yes, and Ron yeah. is the, like, she's like, oh, we need fire, but there's no wood! And Ron is the one who's like, oh my god, use your, use your magic! <laughs> like, you're, a, you have a magical wand! There's a version of this where, like, they're older students, and she's trying to use her lighter, but it's out of fuel. Yes, yes. Uh, no, we know. S- smoke some hash. Uh, for <laughs> McGonagall. All right, so... <laughs> So yeah, she, so, she with a bit of coaching from Ron, is like able to burn the plant. Um, yes. And, you know, we, I really enjoy this scene for like, yeah, I think it informs us a lot about Ron and Hermione as people. Yeah. Um, they, <laughs> also him just being like, honestly, and I can just hear the, under his breath, the very British like tutting. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah. this 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 goes into sort of like the kind of affectionate ribbing you get between them, where mm-hmm. he's like, "Oh my god!" Like, like it's not like, like I can't believe you you forgot that, but it's like you're you're so amazing. I can't believe you forgot that. Like, <laughs> it, 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 I think we mentioned before, like you said, oh, there's a version with like a bit more foul language in the original draft, and this is where uh, Ron, of course, would call her a fucking dizzy cow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, this is this is why I can't tell what's what's British bullshit and what is like Rowling bullshit in this book because dizzy cow that, like that like that, that's a thing oh. and fucking nobbled isn't <laughs> who, who made these rules? I- <laughs> to, uh, to be fair, dizzy cow is the sort of thing you'd say if you wanted to be like jokingly insulting to someone because it's it's not very serious. Okay, all right. So yeah, so then they move on from Devil's Snare and then they get to Flitwick's challenge, I believe. Uh-huh. Which is uh, keys. the keys, keys, which this is again, this is again something that I think in the movies, Harry's the only one who gets on the broom. But in the book, all three of them are have to herd the keys mm-hmm. uh, in order to get it. Uh, and this is kind of another one where I wonder how Voldemort and Quirrell did it by themselves. 
Like, is Quirrell just secretly also a very good seeker? Or did Voldemort go like, okay, summon key and just, mm. you know. Like, did, did, did he just kind of cheat his way through this one? On a, on, a, on a rare serious note from me, I think you do lose something if you have just Harry up on the broom. Because part of how he does it, he, like, passes the challenge, is he has, like, a... Basically, like, a coordinated movement, like a play. Yes. Like you yeah. would do in a sport. Yeah, it is. It does require, like... A, yeah, like kind of knowledge of how like other people moving like yeah do do like like treating it like it's a sport mm. um and i do i do kind of wonder if maybe uh i don't know maybe maybe you're not supposed to like they 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 they're doing the challenges the hard way and that if you're an adult wizard that goes through here the thing that you do is you just wave your wand and bring and get the key like <laughs> well yeah th this is a strange one to me because this feels like if you had like a padlock on your mansion and the way you open it is scoring a penalty like yeah yeah it's... all all of this is actually like it's the the way of the it's a very fun way mm. to cap off the book and i love all of this chapter as like this sequence of skeleton keys, they're they're wonderful skeleton keys. I do yeah. enjoy the skeleton keys, but you do have at some point have to start to question the in-universe logic of this uh, being a, a a viable way to guard the philosopher's stone. There is there is one particular part of this I think I'll bring up when we okay. get to it in just a minute. Um, the next okay. chamber is like a really famous sequence. I think we might have used it for episode art at one point. Oh uh, yeah, back when we, did, when we had things that weren't my beautiful drawings. Yes, um, wizard but, chess. Yes, the wizard chess set, which is this is the Ron, the the Ron in his final form hour. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ron, and, of course, he uh, he takes off his backpack, he pulls out like all of these fully painted miniatures, he starts putting them out <laughs> on the board. <laughs> He he does not do that, but yeah. So we we have McGonagall's giant warhammer set. Is <laughs> what we have. Turns out McGonagall is also a giant warhammer geek, just like Ron. Um, I, I again, I wish I wish this ever came back after this. I like to I, I like to maybe in secret after yeah. this. It's just never mentioned, but There's in the a... books because Harry's rather myopic. Like, Ron takes, like, chess lessons with McGonagall on the side. Oh, yeah, that's fun. I like to imagine that happens. <laughs> Head count and fairy. Head count and fairy. Yes. Um, it's quite, like, it's one of those fun sequences where, like, oh, you have to become the pieces in the game. You have to represent yes. them. And Ron immediately takes charge. He pretty much says, look, don't be offended. You both suck shit. I mean, <laughs> I'm taking the lead here. And they're like, no, yeah, that, that's totally fair, please. And it, I wonder how this this thing resets itself. Did did it say that it resets itself? Because, like, I this, it must so have. yeah, I wonder if Quirrell and Voldemort just like competently played chess their way through this, or I mean, I, I don't know. It's it's possible that that between the two of them, they may be able to, to play chess. I do wonder, like. It would be funny if Quirrell was better at it than Voldemort, but Voldemort <laughs> thought he was better, and this, so they were stuck on this one for a while. This is one of those things that, this is one of the funniest parts of the book that, like, is perfectly fine in the time it was written, but completely falls down now, because you could literally just open up, like, any of the chess algorithms on your phone and beat this puzzle so easily. Okay, <laughs> yes, you, you could you could have cell phones didn't, like, immediately combust yeah. at Hogwarts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, that that is true. Oh, but it's. I, I like how like after this one, her, we we get to uh, the potions room where, oh. with Snape's challenge, and with that one, Hermione's like, "Oh, this is so nice. It's pure what? logic. There's no magic at all." And it's like you just got done with the chess one. What was that? What was we should, that? We should say before we move on. Uh, this is where like Ron, he 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 gets them into a winning position that requires his piece to be taken. And he just gets fucking laid out by a statue. That kid is dead. Yes! Oh my god! He gets, like, <laughs> weeping angeled. And he... It's... Like... 
Him to, like when when, her, when the, they say like what happened like when it, Hermione went back for him, she says that it took a while to revive him, but she did, and then they got out. It's like no, he's got a concussion. That's not a. This is not fine. Maybe this is like wizard body rules where it's like it's like Neville where mm. it it yeah maybe, maybe I don't so, know like wizards are no, just more durable or something. The, wizard the kids. Way. The way it's written, there is nothing I can imagine other than a statue just square punching him in the fucking face. Right, and it's just like no, that's Ron, that, that 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 stone. That Ron hit. just gets decked. <laughs> he does. Oh my god! And Harry and Hermione like manage to have the stomach to keep going after Ron <laughs> has been decked by a stone statue, and. Ah, that's, like, a pa- that's a powerful British energy. You know, your friend got in a fight with a bouncer, he got knocked out, but you move on and you order a kebab anyways. Ah, okay, that's that's true. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of like, this is very much Ron's sacrificial moment here. Mm. Uh, like, I'd say that he, like, Hermione kind of gets hers where, like, she kinda. has has to turn around uh, and Harry goes ahead because there's only enough in the vial for one of them. But Hermione, uh, or, but, um, Because yeah. Hermione doesn't get decked in the face. Right, yeah. I kind of wonder if, should they have switched these two so that, like, Ron, it, it, it escalates mm. in some way? So, like, maybe, but no, that, I guess that wouldn't work because, like... Well, unless you have, yeah, because the, ne- the next room is, like, Snape's uh, puzzle. There are seven potions, and he's written you a gay little poem explaining which one you have to take. I think Voldemort reached this and was like, I'm going to kill him someday. This is, I don't care <laughs> I, if he comes back to my side. I'm hey, going, my snake is going to eat him someday. And and this is, this is the point where I personally take umbrage, because, Snape, this is a fucking puzzle for children. Like... <laughs> This is one of those, like, 101 cool logic games for kids. <laughs> it sucks. Okay. No, I think, it's, I think it's better. No, I think that when we find out what is actually, what's at the bottom of this, which is Dumbledore's thing, I think that maybe Snape just kind of didn't try for his uh, challenge. Yeah. Like, he was just like, all of this is pointless because Dumbledore's thing, either they're pure of heart and they get through Dumbledore's thing, or they're not and they don't. So why do we even bother with the rest of this crap? Mm, I'm just mm. gonna give them, like, this little fucking riddle to waste their time. <laughs> yeah, because it's like a it's a four-step logic puzzle. There's seven vials. you got to figure out which one will get you for the door, and there's also poison, but not even all of the wrong ones are poisonous, which I found quite right. funny. Yes. <laughs> it's it's so... It's like... I don't know, Snape... Snape... He, he, it, he, it, <laughs> he's just fucking about here. <laughs> this, one, this one's really funny, because there's nothing to it. Like, we get the puzzle, you can solve it yourself if you like, but Hermione gets it the next sentence. Yeah, she does. And, I mean, I, I've never tried to solve it. Like, That's I don't know, trying to figure right. out... I, I think that it, it must be... I don't know, I've, I was never very good at those kinds of puzzles. Mm. Uh, so, I, I think I would probably be stuck there for, like, a good 15 minutes. But <laughs> My favorite version of this was there was a Legend of Zelda game where you had to solve a puzzle like this to figure out which walrus murdered a fellow walrus villager. Okay. Yeah, and so... It's fucking Snape. And so, yeah, I, I think that, that that one is the funniest one for Voldemort and Quirrell to encounter. So... <laughs> I wonder I'll... how that would resets itself with the little vials. Uh, maybe there's like a pipe opens in the ceiling and it like gushes more down. Yeah, or maybe there's a ki- some kind of refilling enchantment going on. Because th- those yeah. do exist, uh, but they're kind of weird. I don't know. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't quite know how this works. But I do think that they get to the- Yeah, Quirrell and Snape are just kind of like- Or Quirrell and Voldemort are just kind of like, it fucking Snape. <laughs> it's a classic, like, D&D dilemma as a DM, where you come up with a cool, like, idea for a puzzle, but it's actually quite easy. <laughs> so yes. it's like, the presentation's lovely, but it's like, this is a riddle for kids. 
Yes, yeah. Yeah, Hermione and Harry figure out which of the vials contains the delicious Gatorade. Um, mm-hmm. The way they describe it is like being icy on the way down. I thought for a second he'd put fucking antifreeze in there. Mm. Yeah. But uh, Harry but goes yeah, so forward. Hermione Harry goes go on. Yeah, Her- Her- Hermione goes back to attend to a definitely concussed, if not dead, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of the Gatorade will get him on his feet. God, it's like God, McGonagall's is so much more hardcore than Snape's is. It's yeah, like <laughs> yeah, I, I can kind of like suspend my disbelief for the first few puzzles, but that one really cracks me up. Yeah, but and then we get uh, we move the on to chapter troll. seventeen. Oh, they had a mountain troll. I forgot about that. Very briefly, they pass by a mountain troll that s- someone has already knocked out. Yes. and it's like oh. Great, we didn't have to deal with that one. <laughs> yeah, that would feel quite repetitive, really. But then for real, we move on to chapter 17, uh, Two-Faced Bitch. Yes, the Two-Faced Ho. We pretty much, like, immediately, Harry walks through the door, Quirrell! It's Quirrell! Yep. And I really enjoy that Quirrell doesn't, like, even try to put up a thing of, like, Oh, I was just seeing if the defenses were okay. He just fucking <laughs> spills the entire... Like, he says yes. everything. Yeah, you get the sense, or I get the sense, because I, 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 I have, I like to think about villains and why people give evil speeches uh, apropos of nothing. Um, and I think that maybe Quirrell, like, he, he's been tired of putting on that act all mm. fucking year. He kind of mm. wants to be like, no, I'm Quirrell, I'm I'm Quirrell's Quirrell. I'm the servant of Lord Voldemort. I'm going to be getting fame and riches because I've been so clever. I've been running rings around all of these, like, incredibly famous and, uh, you know, powerful wizards and witches at Hogwarts. And he kind of wants to, like, I don't know, t- tell somebody that, yeah. and show that and show that version of him to somebody. He almost does, like, a reverse, like, Agatha Christie's Praro, where, like, he basically walks around the room revealing to Harry how he did everything. Yes! Yeah, he does. Because I think I think that, like, the, the, my explanation for that would it would be a kind of pride. And maybe he's, like, he, he's, like, gloating to himself, but also, like, making a case to Voldemort why uh, he's such a good servant. In I have way. my I have my own theory, but we'll get onto that in just a second. Um, okay. But like Harry figures out that the best way to get out of this is like Quirrell doesn't seem to know how to deal with the mirror of Erised. Uh, Erised he pulls out, mm-hmm. and if he can keep him talking, maybe he has like enough time to come up with some sort of plan. Yeah. So they, 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 he he basically is like trying to prompt him to explain more of what he did. He asks him about the meeting in the Forbidden Forest, and he says that wasn't actually related to my plan. Uh, me and Snape had a little picnic, you know, tradition. <laughs> um, but he 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 he's kind of like half paying attention to Harry, and he's looking at the mirror. And at one point, he asks himself, "Oh, maybe it's in, if it's inside the mirror, maybe I've got to break it." And this is the point where I figure Quirrell's thing isn't his ego or like a need to reveal his, uh, reveal the ruse. He's just fucking dumb. Yeah, he's... I think Quirrell oh, might I, be I a see stupid what you... person. <laughs> Quirrell's kind of an idiot. That would make... That, that makes it so, like... Oh, you... F- like, I, I, if Quirrell is that dumb... I, I almost feel for Voldemort now because he's been running this whole show <laughs> on the back of this idiot's head. He he he, he genuinely he can't crack it, so he fucking takes the turban off like Dad. Can you help me beat this level of Donkey Kong? <laughs> and Voldemort has to be like the boy. Use the boy. So Quirrell, of course, starts rubbing Harry's face onto the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he, 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 he sticks Harry in front of the mirror, and uh-huh. Harry is expecting to see himself finding the stone, because that's what he wants right now, because that'll save things. Yeah. But and, what he um, sees... And because, like, Quirrell has looked in the mirror already, and he sees himself giving Voldemort the stone. Okay, so, um... Thing... Oh, I was... We could save this for, like, Dumbledore's little thing at the end, but I think I'll do it now, just because... 
it's a small thing. But Dumbledore says that the way the way this works and what ends up happening with Harry, uh, and he explains to Harry how this worked after the fact, hmm. is that only someone who wants the stone but does not want to use it could actually obtain yes. it. Yes. Uh, and I so Quirrell says that I want to I want to give it to my master, but I think Quirrell is lying. Quirrell wants the stone because he Quirrell see looks into the mirror and he sees himself having the stone because he's yeah. ambitious. He wants power, but he lies and tells Voldemort that he sees himself giving Voldemort the stone. And I think Voldemort probably knows that, but doesn't give a shit at all because he's like, this guy's an idiot. I can fool him with whatever. <laughs> uh, we get like we get like a pretty cool description here of like as Quirrell takes off the turban and we see like. Not quite Voldemort's face in the back of his head, but almost like a weird, like, half-grown face. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's very creepy. Especially when Quirrell starts walking backwards towards Harry to intimidate, for, so Voldemort can better intimidate him. Mm. Uh, that is... Yeah, there, there, there's something very, like... I don't know, like this... Harry Potter is very good... It brings it with the imagery, and yeah, this like the the, the face on the the this face this it's like a like half protruding hideous face on the back of this guy's head yeah. is yeah. Um, there's like there's like basically when he has Harry look into the mirror, uh, Harry's reflection winks at him, drops something into his pocket. And when Harry looks into his actual pocket, he is shocked to discover a knife. Um, <laughs> no, he, that, he has the Philosopher's Stone. It's the stone. Like, the mirror... Uh, uh, that's another thing I quite like, of, like, the mirror affecting your reality as you look into it. That's quite cool and spooky. It is, yeah. It doesn't... It makes the mirror f seem even, like... I wonder to what extent this is something the mirror always could do, or this is something that Dumbledore did to the mirror so it could do this with the stone yeah I, I like how it's like a little bit cheeky about it too that's fun yeah well it's sort of like it shows you with the confidence that you wish you possessed just the mirror of like your reflection being like <sighs> as it does it yeah yeah um, it's Quirrell, Quirrell Harry lies and says he just saw like himself winning the house cup. Quirrell falls for it, and Voldemort has to be like, "He's got the stone, you fucking idiot, <laughs> <laughs> you fucking clown!" Oh my god, Voldemort uh, is just—he, you need to get better help, buddy. Qu Quirrell attempts to uh, grab Harry to get the stone off him, but sadly he is deathly allergic to children and immediately suffers third degree burns. Um, oh, okay, okay. I, by the way, I think I think what happened in Snape's in Snape's uh, uh, New York Times riddle room is that <laughs> Quirrell, <laughs> Quirrell, it's Waddle, it's Waddle. Quirrell is there for like, like he he reads it silently to himself and tries to work it out himself. And Voldemort is just like, just tell me what it is. I'll do it for you. Quirrell's like, no, I can do it. I can get it. And they're there for like 15 minutes. Quirrell before... doing the word and he keeps guessing letters he knows aren't in the word. Ah! <laughs> oh, God. But yeah. Okay. Um, but for reasons that will shortly be revealed, he can't touch Harry. It burns him to do so. So he tries to cast a killing curse on him, but Harry, thinking fast like the jockey is, says, fuck this magic shit, I'm wrestling him. Yes! He just kind of starts grabbing Quirrell's face and things to try yeah. just like, I, I have hands that hurt you! Ah! Uh, and Voldemort really at this point has to think, I should not have picked this fucking scrawny little nerd to carry my face around. <laughs> this guy sucks. <laughs> fucking useless. <laughs> Well, then we're just questioning like all of his life choices now. <laughs> uh, Harry starts fading. He is trying to snatch at Quirrell's face. He's trying to snatch at it. He sees it's... a vision of himself snatching at the, at the golden snitch. And then in reality, he snaps back and pulls Dumbledore's glasses clean up his face. Yeah, so Harry uh, faints from the sheer pain that's from the sheer migraine that he is experiencing mm. from his scar. At, like, there, there's. 
he and Quirrell end up in this kind of like duel of endurance where it causes Quirrell in intense physical pain to touch Harry and it's causing Harry like incredible like pain in his head to be interacting with Quirrell. It it's like a really intense version of those like whoever doesn't touch the truck last wins the truck challenges. Something like that. Yeah, it's very uh it, it's it's kind of funny because it's like so it, it it's almost unmagical in the way that it is. Like it's just kind of <laughs> Uh Professor Quirrell is burned to death by a an eleven year old. Yeah, in the movies they have him like crumble to dust. I think that's because they realize it might it might actually have been too graphic to show him like blistering, like he's mm. being touched by a flame. Mm. Um but I kind of I like it the way it is in the books. And I'll sort of get into why why it is the way it is when Dumble describes when, when Dumble exp explains what's causing it. Uh yeah. cuz there's Dumb yeah. Cuz Dumbledore has come and basically is like the, the this is an interesting and personally, I think, kind of weird choice of, like, the last chapter is moving very quickly here. We spent yes. quite a lot of time in chapter 16, and chapter 17 is, like, in comparison. Yeah, and so so uh, we get out of... So Harry faints, and when he wakes up, he's in the hospital wing, and everything's been fixed by Dumbledore. Yeah, Dumbledore, Dumbledore basically is like, here's what happened in the last scene, if you didn't fully understand Yes. Now, okay, so I think that th this is something I think that we we miss mentioning, which is that Dumbledore... Uh, oh, yeah. Well, the last line of defense against the stone had been the presence of Dumbledore at Hogwarts. Yes. And then Dumbledore that day had been called away on important uh, adult business business to, like, the to the government. Yes, and... and up until this point, I thought the reveal was going to be that he knew it was a trick and had stayed at Hogwarts in hiding. No. He was successfully tricked by this bullshit. And I, I guess that, like, Cornelius Fudge is just so obnoxious, is so needy and obnoxious with Dumbledore that Dumbledore believed that this was mm. a plausible, like, the, 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 whatever, whatever thing that Quirrell cooked up for him was plausibly <laughs> Cornelius Fudge. Dear Dumbledore, please come to the Ministry of Magic. I need you to shine my shoes. <laughs> I need to ask your advice on this New York Times crossword puzzle. <laughs> I'm having trouble with this week's wordle. Yes. And he's like, okay, Cornelius Fudge can't tie his shoes. I, I better go. <laughs> uh <laughs> Um, he also mentions that, like, pretty much the whole school knows that something went down, um, but it should have been top secret, and it's like, I, you should not talk so casually about how dog shit you are at your job. <laughs> and then he talks very casually about how dog shit he is at his job. <laughs> A recurring theme with Dumbledore. Okay, okay, so this is, this is, we're about to get, get into some real shit here with fucking Dumbledore. So yeah, we'll, I'm going to we'll, let you take off, but we're, we're going to, uh, th th there's going to be stuff. There's good. There, there's stuff to get to talk about here. We need to basically like, just to clear up a few things that happened in this scene first, uh, Nicholas Flannel without the Philosopher's Stone, which was destroyed by Dumbledore at this point is going to die. But if Dumbledore is quite casual about it, he's like, eh, old dude, probably his time. Well, he says that he talked about it with him. And that this was, yeah, the decision, this was the decision that they came to, and that Nicholas Flamel and his wife, like, they have enough of the elixir left to get their affairs in order, and then they're going to, they're, they're going to die after, like, 600 years of swinging. And <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's you like, know, you know, that's fine, actually. He, he, he's basically, and this is maybe the most reasonable thing he says in this scene, he's trying to pave over the fact that Harry did euthanize these old people. And we're gonna come back to this, to, to this, to this thing, and I have things to say about it. But let's go on for a second. He talks about how Voldemort. Yeah, he agrees with Harry. The guy's not dead. He's. I like how he's quite lichy at this point. Like yes. the idea of like you can't kill a wizard. They've just got too much bullshit on their side. <laughs> yeah, um, and the way that they sort of it goes back to something you said way early on. The way that they spoke of Voldemort, where, like. 
we sort of, like, over the course of the series and sort of, like, Voldemort gets more, becomes more like a human kind of a, a villain. Hmm. Uh, where it's, like, people will call him, like, Wizard Hitler and things and we're, uh, compare him to a human sort of a threat. Is like, oh, like a specific person who's trying to do, take over the world in a specific way. But the way he's treated in this first one, he's more like a force, like a boogeyman. Like yeah, a, like an angry ghost. Yes, and like the way that they say, like, oh, like in, if enough people uh, uh, put in the effort like you did here and they and delay him, we can keep delaying and delaying, and he'll never come back to power. Mm. And that is that doesn't feel like the sort of uh, the sort of thing you'd say about a person. That's the thing you say about like tornado. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's like a force of nature. Uh, or in a volcano, Reba. Ha, ha, ha. This is, uh, that's a very, very specific reference. Um, I think that for here with Voldemort, I think he, he, this is an allegory of sorts. And Mm. what I would say, like what allegory, what he's for is that Voldemort is kind of like a shadow of human nature in a way. Like he's, he's greedy and ambitious and what he really wants at the core of everything is to continue living. And he mm. will go to any means to continue living and amassing power uh, at the cost of anything. Um, and again, you know, that feels dr- quite, that's like quite primal. Like his only drive is self-preservation. Yes, he's like, he's like the, he's very lizard brain, very snake brain. And so it, when you say, like, oh, we, we're delaying Voldemort's rise to power, what that means is more, like, I don't know, like, uh, like fighting back against the, the shadow of... That, that those human traits that are in everyone, that are in, mm. like, you know, like, 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 in humanity just kind of as it is. I, I, maybe I'm getting, getting too, like, kind of, like, it's about the human condition about the thing. Like, take it as, as kind of an allegory for children, what what is the thing that we are defeating and defeating Voldemort here? And I think that it, it is kind of like this is not man versus nature, or th- this is man versus man's own nature kind of a thing. Yeah. What what's with, with the sins that Voldemort is born from? Uh, yeah, I think you're on the money. Is like Voldemort isn't really a human villain in this book. That's Quirrell. Voldemort is more of just a concept. He doesn't really. He kind of touches on some personal stuff with Harry, but he mostly just feels like this is just about self-preservation for him, yeah. Yeah, he's this force that latched onto Quirrell and that used Quirrell, Quirrell was trying to use. Uh, it's sort of like, it, like it, in a way, like Quirrell gave into his own shadow, the, the, old, yeah. his, the demon at the back of his head. Or like and that when... Lovecraftian, like, deep old one sort of thing. Yes, yeah, and it's there's sort of like, I don't know, in a way, like, every, everyone p- could potentially have Voldemort at the back of their head if they let mm. him, like, live there. Literally. Yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But yeah, um, I, I, I do really quite, like, enjoy how Voldemort's set up here, and that may be cause for disappointment in the future, but <laughs> Dumbledore basically says, right, Harry... I'll, I'll give it to you straight. Ask me what you want. I might not answer some of your questions, but I won't lie to you. He then dodges He's... the first question Harry asks. Yes. I won't lie to you, says Dumbledore while lying. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, Harry asks him, like, oh, well, what was up with Snape? Why does he hate me so much? And Dumbledore lies. He doesn't give the real reason. He says this thing about, like, which is probably partially true, that... Uh, Harry's father once saved Snape's life, and Snape is angry that he feels indebted to him. Yeah, and that is part of it. But you, that's you part of had it. to have hated him first for that to make sense as a reason. Right. Well, yeah, he hated Harry's father, and he just kind of says, "Oh, it was just kind of like schoolboy rivalry, rivalry, like with you and Malfoy." I guess because and uh, explaining to Harry what the word "cuck" means. It is a little beyond this 11 year old. <laughs> uh, and then, um, oh yeah, he also said, he says something here that I know is definitely like just straight up a lie, which is like, what did, what did James Potter use the invisibility cloak for while he was at school? 
And it's like, oh, he just used it to, like, steal food from the kitchens and things. And I know that Dumbledore knows that that is not true. Uh, mm. He did a lot more shit with that cloak. But we're not going to get into it yet. Uh, Harry also asks, like, oh, is it you who gave me the cloak? And I'm like, come on, Harry. That's old news. <laughs> Harry's not really good at asking the right questions here. Uh, 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 but yeah, basically, then Dumbledore like, is like, well, that's enough questions for today. Um, mm-hmm. Steals some of Harry's sweets and gets, admittedly, a really good line. Ah, alas, earwax. <laughs> I think that... They kept almost all of the dialogue from the scene verbatim in the movie. Mm. Or at least, I, like, most of it was... This is something that I've kind of... I don't know, we come to appreciate. In this chapter specifically, I'm, I, I think it's because you get a lot of the Golden Trio. And you also get this scene with Dumbledore, which, again, they kept most of it from the movie. If I, Like, I, I, can rem- I can hear that Dumbledore voice in this text. And I don't even think of him as really, like, the Dumbledore in my mind. But I just know that, like, I've I've seen it. And I think that's because, not exactly that it's, like, amazingly written dialogue, but more, it's good at sticking in your mind. And it would feel weird to people if they saw the movie and Dumbledore wasn't saying the things that he says here. Uh, This is perhaps a good moment to try and, like, you know, six episodes in, we're going to establish what, like, that I'm not into Harry Potter, but uh, Harry Potter kids know Michael Gambon is playing Dumbledore in the first movie. I know Michael Gambon from when he rolled his car over going on a corner on Top Gear. Okay, hang on, hang on. Michael Gambon, I think you might have, because there's two Dumbledores. Uh, yes. Michael Gambon is Dumbledore number two. The first Dumbledore is the one in the first movie. I, I know that there's Dumbledore discourse. We we uh, we don't have to fuck with it here because I I honestly don't care. Uh, Ooh, but hey. the Dumbledore like gets a facelift in between the two movies, and he goes from being kind of uh, there's sort of two different interpretations of the character. And I think that the first one might be a little bit closer to the text of him, mm. where he's kind of uh, like the 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 way that he's a little bit ditzy and he's a little bit like. Bit of a bimbo. Little, yes. Bit of a hot bitch. Yeah, and he and that that's kind of like a you like the the degree to which he's not like he 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 may be a little senile. It's it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's 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 talk a little bit about Dumbledore in general here because this is okay, probably I'll- our first sign that he is not very good at his job. Yeah, you do. You, do you want you to go first or me to go first? Because I actually, I, don't know, I, I, there's a story here, to me, of what happened to Dumbledore this year. Um, but if you want to say your, if you want to say your thing first, you can go ahead first. If you have like Dumbledore takes, I'll, I'll go first here and just say there's a little bit in the next scene where like Ron suggests, oh no. Hermione suggests that the cloak was given to Harry so that he could look around. Like, that was deliberate. Mm. And Hermione says, that's terrible. And Harry says, no, I think it's a great idea. And I've got to say, yeah, Hermione is a smart person. <laughs> <laughs> Hermione is correct. <laughs> I, the idea that, like, he gave Harry the cloak so he could sneak around and, like, basically, I don't know, get into trouble... Well, he knows there is a conspiracy going on, or I'd hope he knows. It's bad either way. There's a conspiracy going on to, like, get into the Forbidden Corridor. Is so fucking irresponsible. Yeah? Okay, so... 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 Dumbledore. Dumbledore, sir. Okay. What What is the... The, the spiel that he gives Harry at the end. I think that this is... Lie is not quite the right word. It is kind of a warped version of of the truth, um, of what happened. Or it's like him sort of telling Harry to this in the aftermath after it's been resolved. But he this has kind of it. been so. What was this here? The Philosopher's Stone comes to Hogwarts. Why mm-hmm. does this happen? This happens because Dumbledore 
uh, perceives correctly that the stone is going to be threatened at Gringotts. Gringotts is no longer safe enough for it. And it's a very powerful thing. It gives you unlimited gold and life. And so it needs to be... One of two things needs to happen to it. Either it needs to be put somewhere even safer, which if that's even possible, or it needs to be destroyed. Uh -huh. And Dumbledore says at the end here that Nicholas Flamel and his wife are totally fine with dying. This is not a big deal to them. They've been around for 600 years. They're cool with this. So my question is, why did they not, why didn't they just destroy the stone to begin with? Good point. And Good point. <laughs> I think that the, ob the answer to this, that Dumbledore has not said, is that Dumbledore didn't want the stone to be destroyed. Yeah. And I think that the reason for that, you, you could describe multiple reasons to that. I think that the most charitable one is that Dumbledore didn't want to let his friend die. Mm -hmm. And so in the kind of mix of that impulse and his own hubris, Dumbledore said, okay, Gringotts is no longer safe enough for the stone. I The stone needs to be kept so that my friend can continue to live, but I want... And so I'm going to, I will personally ensure its safety for you, my friend. Gring, Gringotts, you know, you may have your dragon. However, I have a drunk gamekeeper, so. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! And so Dumbledore decides to take the, so Dumbledore says, I will, I will personally oversee its protection. And so he brings it to Hogwarts because that's where, that's where he, he lives. That's, that's where he is. He is at Hogwarts. And which is the worst place you could possibly take it because it's a children's school mm -hmm. and this thing is a magnet for the worst possible people. Be but like this is a child endangerment like hazard that you are bringing here. But Dumbledore in his hubris thinks, no, 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 it'll be fine because I will protect it and save my friend. And it's um, like, so... Of course, we, we can make it safe for the kids, though. We just tell them not to go to a corridor, because when has a child ever broken the rules at school? Right, at fucking Hogwarts. And then, uh... One Snape... old man and his cat will stop them sneaking out. And then, uh, Snape starts to suspect that Quirrell might be after the stone. And I assume if Snape suspects this, that Dumbledore also knows this. Like, that that, that, that is a channel to Dumbledore is Snape knowing things. And so Dumbledore knows that so that that Quirrell is after so let, let's let's say let's say he doesn't think that Quirrell is working for Voldemort. He just Quirrell might be inter interested in, in going after the stone. But Dumbledore continues to be so confident in his in his ability to keep the stone safe with his Miravera said plan. And also I guess like the other staff members who like and respect Dumbledore are going along with this plan and are like, okay, we'll bolster you. We'll help you out with this thing, even though it's an obviously awful idea, but we'll put these like traps and whatnot in place to uh, also keep the stone safe. Mm -hmm. um, and Dumbledore continues in his hubris to feel that this is a good and functioning course of action. Um, and year proceeds, and it's not until... Uh, the thing that honestly you you might you may have you may have should have seen coming double okay so I think that when Harry says that he left the cloak for me he wanted to give me the chance to fight Voldemort I don't think that's it exactly I think what's more what might be more it is that this was a test for Harry in a different way um and this is gonna go into stuff that's like <laughs> mega deep test. spoilers. That it was a test for him to mind his business, and he fucking failed. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. It was sort of like, I think Dumbledore f realized that the Scooby gang was kind of poking into the stone, like Harry said, and realizing what was going on. But I don't think it was clear to Dumbledore what they hoped to achieve with that, uh, or that they thought they were stopping. Vo like, do they think that they're doing a good thing by doing this, or are they kind of shitty kids who are after the stone for its own sake. Hmm. And so I think this was more like a moral test for Harry uh, if he would pursue the stone for the stone or not. Yeah. And 
why Dumbledore would want to give Harry that kind of moral test is kind of mega deep spoilers that we're not going to get into, but... Okay. But, um, but, but I suppose in a way it's also like set up by the moral test of him just showing him the mirror. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And sort of showing him how that works. And so only someone who's pure of heart, who wanted the stone not to use it, could get it. Here's the thing, though. If you wanted to... to if you wanted to, to keep the stone safe through that method, that's a very clever method with the mirror. Good job, Dumbledore. Also, good job sticking the, the, the mirror in a school full of children so you so Voldemort could have ready access to someone who might be pure of heart. Who I could... Mean, you know, not to be crass, but Dumbledore, you could have just shoved that thing up your asshole that probably would have been more secure. <laughs> yes! Oh my god. And so... I think that there's, like, this gap when Harry is out cold in the hospital wing. And, like, when Dumbledore show, like, re- shows up, uh, everything's on fire, someone is trying to get the stone, and Harry is stopping them. And that it's Vold- like, and Dumbledore's little house of cards and hubris that he has built for himself crumbles when he goes into that room and he sees that Harry is about to die because, like, <laughs> yeah. because like Dumbledore put the Philosopher's Stone at Hogwarts. Um, yes, like 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 he was correct. His security would have held up if it weren't for the fact that he just didn't watch out for one of his students. Yes. Yeah. And so, like like he says that like. He was. He felt like I thought. I thought I might be too late. And Harry's yeah. like, "Oh, to get to save the stone." He's like, "No, to save you." And it's I think of, that it's kind of beautiful that like Dumbledore's failing here was not in any of like his actual planning. It was his failure and his duty of care. Yeah, exactly. And I think that Dumbledore, I think he learned a lesson this book this year, <laughs> which was that you know it. He had kind of a come to Jesus moment there, and that's why he then decided to do the thing that he should have done to begin with, which was allow Nicholas Flamel to destroy the stone. Yes. Now, not to, I don't really know much about the next book, but I'm pretty sure that lesson didn't sink in too well, because I feel like a lot of kids got ate by a snake. Ah, we're we're gonna see. Uh, we're we're gonna see. Yeah, do, you, um, do, do you think that's all of our Dumbledore thoughts? I think that's that's pretty much my Dumbledore thoughts. Okay. Um, so but yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's no yeah, that, that, that. None of this really matters in terms of like Dumbledore's moral failings because what he does next is the real horseshit. Um, Harry is allowed out for the <laughs> like end of year banquet where they're going to announce the winner of the House Cup. Room oh god, yes, we out. hadn't even gotten to this fucking shit yet. <laughs> Rooms decked out in Slytherin colors. They've been told they've won. They've got like the leaderboard up on the thing. Uh, little bit of a little bit of J.K. Rowling, like not having a great head for numbers. These figures they're giving for the whole year seem way too low. <laughs> yeah. House point wise, considering the rate they were getting them in the story. Maybe they maybe. Like other people were really, maybe like other people were troublemaking off screen that we didn't see, and so they, so they got sliced in house points too. <laughs> but yeah, like like at this point, it seems like Slytherin has won it. Um, however, as Dumbledore begins speaking, he goes through each and every member of the Scooby Gang, awarding them ludicrous volumes of house points. Uh, 50 to Ron for playing a good game of chess. 60 for dying. To, six, yes, 50 to Ron for taking a punch real well. 60 to Harry for facing down Voldemort. 50 to Hermione for solving a puzzle for five-year-olds. <laughs> for solving a new, the New York Times crossword puzzle. And finally, to tilt them over the edge, 10 points to Neville for standing up to his friends. Which is kind of funny that Neville must have told them what happened to him. <laughs> and that's enough to like tip basically it literally takes Gryffindor from last to first place and he fucking is like oh we should have a change of decor and fucking changes the colors of the room uh, Gryffindor has won Snape has to give a embarrassed handshake to McGonagall 
and I am sat here thinking, this is the biggest load of horse piss <laughs> I have seen in my life. I, I have no words to help you. <laughs> like, like, I know they're, I know they're pretty much all shitty kids. But imagine how fucking mad you'd be if you were in Slytherin and you didn't really know, know about any of the stuff that went down. Oh my you god! Just, you were just a perfectly nice kid, kept your head down, played Quaid Quidditch, and he pulls this shit on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the headmaster of the school flipping you off. God. And it's like... <laughs> F- f- fuck, fuck the Quidditch thing. This is the most unfair scoring system in Harry Potter. It is. The house cup is such fucking bullshit. It's it's amazing. I... God, I... It's, it's so... <laughs> uh, especially because I'm assuming that Dumbledore was in Gryffindor himself. Oh yeah, he was. He absolutely was. The, oh, this fucking sucks. You suck, dude. <laughs> Yes, this this does this 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 does absolutely blow dry. And it's it's like made. It's so dumb, and it's like like it, the the blow of it. Try they try to stop it by being like, okay, like Slytherin has won for like the past seven years in a row. It's time for somebody else to win, and it, the like the other houses go along with this fucking bullshit because they're just happy to see Slytherin finally lose. <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> which I mean. I, maybe the other house you should try harder. God damn it. Yeah, maybe maybe you should try harder and try to get involved with the philosopher stuff. I like how, like, okay, remember how we were talking about, like, McGonagall is street smart with the students and knows how to deter them from doing stupid, dangerous shit? Yeah. D- Dumbledore is the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah, because, again, that's the other thing of it, of, like, it's so backwards for him to award them all these points, ignoring the fact that it should be like, if anything, they're in trouble for breaking the rules and putting themselves in danger. Oh my god! Well, it's like, actually, like, folding in what, what we had just been talking about. Like, he's rewarding them for breaking the rules and putting themselves in the danger that he put at the school. Hmm. So, I... Fuck you, Dumbledore! <laughs> Fuck you, Dumbledore! C- congratulations, you defeated my test of hitting you over the head with a belt. Oh my god. <sighs> but yeah, you know, if you can't beat the kids in the basement with a vitamin D deficiency, that's on you. Oh my god. <laughs> but the book, like, we, again, really quickly move through some of these last chapters. Uh, yeah. We go to everyone going home. Uh, on the Hogwarts Express, uh, we drop we drop Harry off with Uncle Vernon. He is described as being purple in the face. Here, I think he is having a stroke, um, or his collar's just too tight. Dudley isn't mentioned here. I'm very angry. Oh, he is. He, he Dudley. Uh, Dudley gets is mentioned in the very last line of the book. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. You know, this entire time I thought we'd eventually get back to Dudley, and all we find out is he's going to see torment and suffering in the sequel. <laughs> well, her, yeah, but we end on a note of vengeance, malice. where the vengeance and malice, where Harry says that over the summer, like, okay, so the rules are that you you're not allowed to use magic outside of school when you're a child. Uh, and this is, of course, after, like, a, the stuff that happens before you go still doesn't really count because you can't really control it. No one's taught you how yet. But once you've been taught how to channel your magic appropriately, you're not supposed to use it outside of school and definitely not in front of muggles. Uh-huh. However, however, the Dursleys don't know this. And so Harry, that's the note Harry ends on that because uh, yeah, they yeah. don't know that he can't use magic. He's, he's not legally allowed to use magic on them. He can then hold that over Dudley for the, for the rest of the summer. So immediately he uses the binding spell on Dudley and steals his Atari. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll find you'll find out what what the situation is there. But if he uses magic, the wizards will know. Oh, but okay, okay. The, if he uses magic, the wizards will know. But the Dursleys don't know. Like he can he can hold that threat over Dudley. I see. I see. 
Yeah, that, I, I suppose that isn't clear, though. So, yeah. <laughs> we end on a note on, on vicious glee and vengeance from, from our protagonist. So, yeah, that was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Yeah, that was a, that was a book. Uh, so, yeah, we got to the end of the year. There's no homework left, but there is the end of year exams. Right. So now, as y'all know, if you are repeat listeners of the pod, we have a thing at the end of every batch of chapters. Uh, that's the extracurriculars where we ask ourselves three questions. Uh, and so we, we, give, we, we each give our answers to those three questions. Uh, the, the three questions are usually uh, who is the chosen one, which is who is your favorite character? Uh, what is your um, a magic? What is the magical moment of the week? which is something magical that really stood out to you. Um, and then we have peak rowling, which is something uh, something very rowling that stood mm. out to you, for better or worse. Um, and I have a, yeah, I've got a pretty good one in that category. Oh, okay. We, 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 might, well, we might touch on this then, anyhow. Uh, but this time, what we instead of doing the, the usual extracurriculars, I was thinking we could do an end-of-the-year exams looking back on the book as a whole. And so... For the first one, instead of being who is the chosen one of the week, it's who won the house cup of the book? Mm -hmm. Who gets 150 points to Gryffindor, completely unjustly awarded by Dumbledore? (laughs) (laughs) Who who is the MVP of this book in total? I think my answer here is fairly predictable if you've been listening to what I've been saying as we go along. It's going to be Neville. Okay, yes. I Go think ahead. Neville's arc in this book is... so. This, one thing I find very amusing about it is it's not really like, oh, he starts off cowardly, but he gets a little bit braver at a time. He starts off a coward, he gets one drop of bravery, and he spends the rest of the book picking fights he cannot win. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I respect that so fucking much. Yeah, he never... And the moment he gets at the end is not like, oh, Neville Neville did the one thing and that's how it pushed us over the edge to save the world. No, he actively hindered us in our attempt to save the world. But it was very, for on the scale of Neville and Neville's life, it was very impressive. <laughs> yeah, and I think in the moment, like, th- this is justice for Neville. He, were, he had been... Pretty badly, like, thrown under the bus by the Harry gang this whole time. Yeah. Yeah, it... it yeah, he's... It, it, it is, like, this... this. I, I'm glad... I'm, I like that you kind of pick him out of there, because I never... Until this reading, like, I never fully kind of, like, paid attention to it. But... Yeah. It has a very, like, it, it hangs together, this the thing with Neville that, that's consistently going on in the background. And the way that, like, the Scooby gang are influencing him, not quite really meaning to, uh, where the, like, they, they encourage him, but they also don't quite let him hang out with them, and he's still kind of, like, the lame one. And, like, I think that they do, like, sometimes... Like, I think there, there's one bit where Ron says, like, oh, Neville will play Quidditch for England before X something happens. Like, they do kind of make fun of him behind his back Which, a bit. I don't know. If taking the football an- analogy, we were pretty shit at football back then. He might have been able to play for England. <laughs> That's fair. I, well, I, it'd be funny if, like, Wizarding Britain is actually very shit at Quidditch oh, I- internationally. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah. Uh, but uh, just to uh, get it out there, we're quite good as of late, just to get on the record. Oh, we are? We are. Am I at football? Yeah, um, I'll throw this in. There's a fun little bit of like Britishism. We recently got like a really good squad of quite uh, younger players, and. The real sad thing is a lot of them got, like, a lot of racist abuse, especially Marcus Rashford, who oh. is just, like, advocate for anti-youth poverty. Uh, everyone got real fucking quiet when they started winning games, though. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, so, like, this is, like, England's team? Yeah, this is the England national side. Oh! Wow, okay, I didn't know that 
England was good at football again. I hadn't. Yeah, I had not we, heard about that. We had a good result in the last World Cup. I believe we got to the semis, and we got to the finals of the last European Cup. Oh dang! Well, that, well, good for you. Good for you guys. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So uh, for me, the winner of the House Cup, the MVP of the book for me is th- this has been this has been Ron Weasley and the Philosopher's Stone. This, <laughs> I don't know. I, again, this is also you've been listening to the pod. You've kind of noticed this that like once an episode, Reba stops the stops the uh, the program to give a, a sermon about why why Ron Weasley uh, deserves his due. And I don't know. I just he 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 has been consistently like a very bright spot like over the course of the book. I think that, that that may be it for me, like the way that he's consistently there and consistently like great character, great, like, I don't, it, I don't know. It just, I, I've had sort of like justice for Ron feelings for, yeah. for a while. And I kind of like, I was, I was feeling it very strongly on this reading that like, wow, this is like actually a very good character and he's doing a lot. He makes a lot happen in this story and he kind of gets no credit uh, take like in the series as a whole, he's kind of just like he's Harry Potter's stupid friend, and it's like no, he's actually he. Some sometimes he's kind of the one running the show. Not always, but I don't know, like he's he he took a stone statue fist to the face in this cha- in these chapters. So I think that that kind of clinches it for me. This is yeah, uh, the Ron Weasley story. I, uh, I totally get that. Like, my favorite Avatar character was always Sokka, and I appreciate uh, a guy whose superpower in the story is being smart. Yes! And that kind of is. Like, they keep being like, oh, Hermione's the smart and logical one. And it's like, mm. yeah, sometimes, about some things, but also, like, what, what what is chess? That's not magic. That's, you know, <laughs> chess smarts. It... <sighs> Uh, justice for Ron and his brain and his fu- very functioning brain. It, it, it's a bit of an insult to Hermione that like her thing is like she solved a logic puzzle. Meanwhile, Ron won a fucking game of chess. I know. Oh my god! <laughs> Hermione solved Snape's bullshit uh, wordle, and <laughs> and they're all like, "Yay, Hermione's the smart one." And then Ron's <laughs> over here who played like basically like who played. Like virtual chess with McGonagall, and t- took a bu- took uh, you know a weeping angel to the fist to the head, and <laughs> it's like <sighs> not all wizards are created equal. No. Um, so what's our next category? Our next category is uh, the magical memory. So mm. usually a magical moment centers on like a specific like a little thing, like uh like oh you like the the dead unicorn. Or something like, oh, like like the ceiling at Hogwarts or something like that. Where it's like a little magical thing that stands out to you and is very memorable and kind of sticks with you. This is more like a magical centered scene or like an event that happened in the book. Harry Potter is, it, like every, cha- especially like in this book, we kind of got to see how like every chapter delivers like at least like one or two, sometimes more like events and scenes that happen uh often yeah. center around magical things but i this can also kind of be magical maybe in like a broader sense uh mm. where it's like oh that's this is just like this is why you want to come back to hogwarts or this is why you want to pursue a career in accounting um so i think my choice here this might be recency bias bias talking but i do really love the sequence of like the different challenges set up by the professors so i think that's my pick that, I think, is a very valid one, yeah. The, the skeleton think, key run. Th- part of it is, like, I think I've established a few times, I like when magic feels a little bit more, like, mystical and unexplainable. And even though this challenge is set up by the professors, I like that it's quite cerebral. It's not, like, a lock that's magically enchanted. It's, like, challenges. It feels very, like, Indiana Jones, almost. Yeah, and every single one of them does involve some degree of strategy, one mm. way or another. And like uh, how it like reflects the professor who set up the challenge. Yeah, like you got the first one with Fluffy, where you don't like knock Fluffy out. You play a, a tune for him, uh, the best now, you can. Of course, 
if you took Hagrid's advanced class, you'd know the real answer here is a shotgun. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, and, like, with Flitwick's thing, you have to, like, herd the keys and mm. catch the key like you're catching a snitch. And, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that. They are very, um, I, I, think that's a, I think that's a really strong pick for the book. Um, uh, what was your pick, Reba? Mine is, mine's actually kind of balances this in a way, because I'm going to take us all the way back to be the beginning for mine. I kind of, like, I meditate on this for a bit. Like, what really, what kind of stands out to me is, like, you think of this book, Harry Potter Philosopher's Stone. What is the thing that I think of when I think of this book? What is, like, oh, that's why I want to read it again? Um, Because I have now read it many times. And for me, it kind of is um, Hagrid breaking down the the door. And Mm. way back at the beginning, when when he first meets Harry. Uh, or where Harry first meets him, I guess. And I, I don't know, it just kind of, the there's the buildup to that moment, uh, and then there's the scene itself. And, like, after that, like, that is, that is, the, like, maybe the best hook possible for this yeah. story. Like, if you weren't, like, if you're just kind of like, okay, wizard, what is this? You got this kid. This is the, we're living in the world of Dudley Dursley. And then Hagrid breaks down the door and... Full on Shrek, somebody once told me. Right, it's like the wizarding world is cool aid manning itself into <laughs> Harry's life. <laughs> and kind of like to into the collective consciousness of children around the world mm. when, when, when Hagrid does that. And he sort of, it, it kind of presents like, I don't know, you, you, right, ahead, right away you get kind of like the contrasts of it. Where he's this very frightening figure. He's got the wild hair. He's this very like imposing presence. But he's also here to give you a birthday cake and give you unconditional like validation for the first yeah. time in your life. And it's a, and it's I don't know like that. You could say that sort of like establishes Hagrid's character, but also the world in general. It's dangerous, and scary, but it'll give you validation. Right, exactly. Yeah, and it's it, it introduces you to this whole thing and sort of it tees it tees you up in that way, and it then the the book itself just kind of has to live up to the promise of that moment, where it's like okay, the it's like we're kicking down the door. You're gonna come with me to this amazing magical world, and then the world has to be as cool as the moment of Hagrid breaking down the door is, and yeah. I think that it does like it manages to do that because like. This book leaves nothing, uh, like it, it puts every it puts all of its cards on the table pretty much. I, I, okay, a few of them it doesn't. Like I think Rowling has said that like she had the idea for the rest of the series already when she wrote this, uh, but I like I, I I don't know to how detailed that was because it feels like with this one it's like okay we're gonna have dragons we're gonna have unicorns we're gonna have broomsticks we're gonna have everything. And, like, I know, like, there, there's a lot of pressure now for a sequel. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so uh, that's my magical memory. Um, and then now, our final exam, our final, final exam is, what did we learn this year? Uh, what, what is the moral of the story to you? Uh, Rowling, con- Rowling considers herself to be a very moral writer she said that in interviews and so with that in mind i think it's i think it's it's appropriate for uh instead of having like our peak rowling moment to, to kind of take in and ask ourselves you know what 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 is our takeaway uh from this book that we just read the authorities cannot help you vigilante justice is the way <laughs> Uh, do you afford to say with that? Or is that, like, kind of self-evident here? I think it speaks for itself. Okay. And Dumbledore does, like, swoop in at the end to help. But, like, he's... It's the problem that he made that is the thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think I think that's valid, yeah. I think... Uh, my moral of the year is that keeping a Philosopher's Stone at a school for children is a bad idea. In fact, it's a pretty good way to get children killed. 
And in, in, in fact, I think I could go so far as to say that having a Philosopher's Stone at all might be a mistake. And you could have just gotten rid of it. Yeah. All those months ago. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like Dumbledore talks about the Philosopher's Stone, like, ah, oh, it can give you such dangerous things. And it's like, yeah, bitch, get rid of it. Yeah, this is only here because you put it here. Why did you do that? And yeah, I, uh, most charitable reason is that Dumbledore didn't want to let go of his friend. Uh, mm. Uncharitable reason. I, I think, I think it's, it's a combination of that and then the, Dumbledore has just such a fucking ego. So the like the, the sheer hubris of Dumbledore. He thought that putting the Philosopher's Stone at his school for children would end well for literally anyone. Um I think then that is our end of year exams uh done. I'm gonna keep the exam paper to burn it later <laughs> on. Um as you do. Uh with with uh, McGonagall's hash box of hash, um, <laughs> did we? Uh, is there anything that you want to say as we close this out? Like this is uh, uh, you you as you as the newcomer to to this series. How are you feeling having now witnessed the book? I think um, just first to get like a slightly mushy note out of the way. Uh, when I asked you to do this, this was very much like a sort of pie in the sky idea. I wasn't sure we'd f- even follow through on. So it's been really cool to make something with you and, you know, at least we've gotten one book down down, down the pipe. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it only, it only gets harder for here because they, they get way longer in size. But yes. <laughs> so Reba is someone I've always, like, respected a lot as a writer and an artist. And it's just been really cool getting a chance to make something with her and Aww. talk about something really important to her. That That is very mushy and sweet. And thank you for saying that for our 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 audience to hear <laughs> uh and i like yeah back at you this has been very enjoyable uh to make with you um and i, I was kind of i i think i have been we it, we can maybe talk about this a little bit and kind of if it's boring i suppose but when we first started talking about this it was between one of two things it was we were either going to do a harry potter podcast or we were going to do like a disney podcast and I think I've been kind of pushing towards Harry Potter because, like, I, know I got enough Disney in my life in other places. Um, mm. But I just kind of, like, is... Yeah, it. I, I'm glad that we went this route because I feel like I've genuinely... I've learned a lot about this that I didn't before when I've read the series. And that's and that's because, like, uh, coming into it with you as a, as a, as a reading buddy, like, the, I, I think that the podcast works well with both of us and you bring a lot to the table with uh well like sort of from the british perspective and also just kind of like from yeah like the practical angle of <laughs> <laughs> someone who doesn't really have the nostalgia goggles on in the same yeah. way uh like i like to think of myself like I, I like to think i'm not too nostalgia goggled as things go but i mean i am obviously um yeah uh, I definitely thought this was like a really solid book, and it makes sense how it became a phenomenon, you know, with this really solid foundation and a bit of luck. But yes. obviously, you're going to get things like a fresh read that you won't get uh, once you're like willing to go along with the world. And I think that's like the fun thing about this perspective. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this has been. Uh, I have enjoyed doing this a lot, and I, and I, I hope we do manage to like at least get to the second book. We'll see if we get through all of them. I have a feeling, oh, I worry when we get to like the fourth and the fifth book. And that's <laughs> that's when that's when the page counts down to really balloon. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's also when uh, the books get a bit less. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to have to look this up. I know that like Rowling was going through a bout of depression while she was writing some of them. Um, uh. And that that starts to kind of show. Uh, and it's. I don't know, like 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 they 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 become much more uh, like challenging reads. Let's put it that mm. way. As as you move through them, um. So we'll we'll see. Well, I I I I really hope that we can keep going with this because I am like I I'm very interested in continuing to like uh, explore this series uh, with my with my intrepid yeah. with, with the intrepid Matt at my side. 
I I am always been a firm believer that like uh, it's best to experience things with other people, it, even if you're like reading it individually and then discussing it. You're always going to get more out of a work by like bouncing ideas off other people. I think that's definitely true. Yeah. All right. So I think that's that might be the note to end on because that's very. I don't know. I feel like that that kind of sums up like the 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 being here. Yeah. Um. So. All right. So now that now that we finished all of the episodes, we we are gonna see if we can get all of this up on like Apple Pod or someplace mm-hmm. real besides the the YouTube page. But for now, it is on the YouTube page. Uh, for all the people who are listening, um, and for us, where you can find us, uh, there are links. As always, there are links in the doobly doo. Uh, for you to you to find our stuff. Um, you can find my stuff at. Uh, I have links to. The, the, if you if you want context for that little volcano joke that Matt made earlier, <laughs> uh, you can check out my links below. Um, and for Matt, uh, your pluggables? Uh, yeah, the main thing I've got going on right now is a Twitter. Um, you can follow me <laughs> at PRP Gecko. I have stuff I want to work on, and that may be you know coming down the pipes uh, mm-hmm. this year, next year. So in the meantime, I'll. I'm pretty funny. I'm pretty good with it. <laughs> he's, a, me he, on that. he's a podcast guy and a Twitter guy. Ooh. <laughs> White boy on Twitter and with a podcast. Damn. <laughs> you now have that. I. Uh, this is. You, you now have that on your Discord, which is asking about <laughs> my podcast. Uh, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Matt. <laughs> this is where we are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, and I get, uh, I, I say this, uh, I have, I post this in the comments of all of the YouTube, uh, cha- like, uh, of, on the YouTube page, uh, I oh. hit a comment to the top of it, uh, to reaffirm, uh, this pod's support for trans rights and its disavowal of Rowling's bigotry. I feel... That, that, that might be harder to... I, we may have to put a clip of something in front of the pod or, like, in the pod if it goes on Apple Pod because we won't have the pinning comments method there. Um, yeah. I, I also just wanted to add, sort of, as a closing remark at the end of this, just to underline that. Uh, we don't spend a ton of time on it because that's not really what the show is about. Uh, but, yeah, and it's 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 gotten dramatically worse lately so Mm -hmm. i may have to update those links um uh we have discussed it at some points in the podcast when it's come up but yeah i think it's important to establish like we want this to be a fun listen for people we don't want this to be dragged down by like constantly discussing um just her really unpleasant views but yeah it's very much worth saying we do not stand by what she says and uh consider not financially supporting the harry potter franchise yeah, we uh we we read the books through a very uh legal means. Uh-huh. Um <laughs> very, very very yeah, very legal and Owl and... brings me my copies. Yeah, exactly. Uh we we get them by Owl. So, uh we paid the Owl uh but not Ms. Rowling. But yeah, um, we hope you have enjoyed this sort of first season of Hogwarts Dropout Radio. Thanks again for tuning in. Mischief Managed. Mischief Managed. 